What's up, everybody? Tim Anderson here, aka Renfail. Behind me, I have Luke and Leia. People have asked about them recently because they haven't always been in here. Um, they're growing up and they're exploring. But they're here today with Daddy as he reads through the next chapter in the Mondays in Middle Earth series. Today, we're doing Chapter 7. The Battle for Helm's Deep. I got my notes here. I just finished up the chapter a little bit ago on the Kindle. Um, today we're only doing one chapter. Helm's Deep was a big enough chapter, and there was a lot going on, and I've got some really... You know, I just got thoughts. I got thoughts, and I want to talk about all this, so we're going to cover it today. Lucas may end up jumping on my lap. We'll see. He's been really needy recently. Um, it is nap time right now, but I just drank a cup of coffee to stay awake for this, so he may get grumpy and be like, Daddy, come... Come take a nap. <laughs> if you've never tuned in for one of these before, welcome. This is the Mondays in Middle Earth show where I read through The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and The Silmarillion ahead of, hopefully, uh, The Rings of Power show so I continue to update myself on things that I don't remember or forgot or or things that I didn't know about The Lord of the Rings when I read them last 20 years ago because the internet wasn't available like it, was to, like it is today. Um, we are into the two towers right now, and again, today is Chapter 7, Helm's Deep. Uh, don't forget, if you haven't watched previous episodes, this is a great place to pause the video and go check out the previous playlists. And of course, don't forget, we have a Discord channel set up in our server specifically around conversations for this if you want to have greater conversations about this chapter or beyond as we continue our read-through. Um, I think Chapter 7 here for me is... It's one of the best chapters in terms of where we get a sense of Tolkien's expertise because he actually saw real warfare. Like he was in the trenches, like during you know World War, the World Wars, and and um, this is there's there are things that you and I will never know in terms of the the life experiences that we bring to the table when we're writing a book. Uh, a lot of my characters, I have ranching backgrounds and I have construction backgrounds, so you'll see that crop up in my work because those are things that I'm an expert on, and so I can easily write about those things. I also hate to sweat, and so uh, you'll notice that some of the characters in my books, we, somebody picked up on this one time and said, hey, your characters sweat a lot. Is that because you sweat a lot? And I went, you, sir, <laughs> are paying attention. <laughs> Because I am also a sweater, and so it's a natural, you know, I, I inject those things in here. And this is a warfare chapter, make no mistake. This is all about siege warfare, and this is all about numbers and and strategy, and it, this is a chapter all about war. And so it's a fascinating deep dive into that. Um, we get our first sense of wars coming, though, here as they are riding towards the Fords of Aizen. And it says, while there are no clouds overhead yet, a growing darkness can be seen as if a great storm was moving out of the east, met by another shadow that was creeping down slowly from Isengard. Gandalf asks Legolas if he can see anything with his elf eyes in the darkness coming from Isengard, and Legolas replies that he can see great shapes moving in the darkness, but he cannot tell what they are because a veiling shadow of some power lays upon the land as if the twilight from endless trees were flowing downwards from the hills, and Gandalf replies, and behind us comes a very storm of Mordor. It will be a black night. So we're being pressed from two sides here. We have the darkness of Saruman and the darkness of of Sauron and it's pushing on both sides towards the men of Rohan. So the objective here is they want to wipe out men of Rohan because they want to cut off any aid to Gondor that they possibly can and just crush men and all the hope that they might have of resisting. Um, on the second day, as they're riding forth, the storm finally catches up with them and it says, there's, there's this scene as they're ending the day, it says, in the last red glow, men in the vanguards see a black speck a horseman riding back towards men it's a scout who's here to tell them that the fords of eisen have fallen that saruman has allied himself with the wild hillmen and herd folk of dunland the shield wall is broken and the Irken brand of westfold has drawn off and gathered those men he could towards the fastness and helms deep um, he then tells the group you need to return to aomer and say there's no hope um the wolves are here we should fall back to edoras we're not going to survive 
and it's here when Theoden steps forth. No one knows the king is actually here. And the scout is, and he calls out the scout by name. And the scout is so overwhelmed by joy at the king being here that he he offers up his notched sword and says, you know, Lord, command me. I didn't know you were here. And Theoden gives this speech about how, yes, I know you thought I was still under the spell of Sauron. Saruman. Had a sneeze there. Sorry. Um, you thought I was still under the spell of Saruman. Um. Don't worry about it. We're here. We're riding forth. We're not going back without battle. Um, this is when Gandalf rides ahead and sits alone, gazing north to Isengard and west towards the setting sun. That suddenly comes back and tells him they should ignore the fords of Isen and ride as quickly as they can to Helm's Deep. And then he just disappears. It says like a shot fired from an arrow, Shadowfax was gone so fast that no one caught it other than a glimpse of like silver light just gone into the into the night. Um, one of the guards, this is a very interesting thing here. It says, one of the guards questions what that meant. And Hama replies that Gandalf comes and goes unlooked for. And the guard says, well, if Wormtongue were here, he would have an explanation for it. And Hama replies, well, I prefer to wait until Gandalf returns. And the guard says, well, maybe you'll be waiting a long time. Which shows that even though the king is out, you know, and everything else, the people still don't trust Gandalf. And even though Wormtongue may have been proven ill by some people, he's still a familiar evil. And so people when in dire straits will turn to the familiar. And it goes to show you that, you know, if that's going on right now in their despair, they would rather have Wormtongue than Gandalf. Um, or at least this person would, which shows these lingering thoughts that are still with the people here. Um, as they arrive, we get a sense of the age here because it says that the men... In the far, far off days of the glory of Gondor, the Sea Kings had built here this fortress with the hands of giants and called it the Hornburg. What does that mean? Built it with the hands of giants. That's a, a very f odd phrase of text. I don't know what that means. It, can someone who may know more than me, or or have more information from the greater lore of Middle Earth, if you have something you can refer to here, please drop that down in the comments below. Um, because I don't know what we're referring to here. It just says, the glory. You know, this was built in the glory of Gondor when the Sea Kings had built up this fortress with the hands of giants and called it the Hornburg. Okay, as they're arriving, scouts report that wolf riders are abroad in the valley and a host of orcs and wild men are hurrying southward. Um, they seem to be making for Helm's Deep. We get a sense of numbers here because the scout says that as they flew, they counted two to one odds, but that they estimate the main strength of the enemy is many times greater and it has yet to arrive. So we're starting to get a sense of the numbers here. Um, I don't know that we ever get told the exact numbers, but um, unless that's out there as well, if it is, drop that down below. Let me know. Uh, it says they, as they arrive, they look behind them and see many great flames, torches, and more. Aragorn says it is a great host and follows us hard, to which Theoden replies, and they bring fire. And they're burning as they come. Rick, Cot, and Tree. They're just raising the land behind them. This is Saruman and Sauron. They want to eradicate Rohan. They want to eradicate the men of Rohan from the face of the planet. Um, as they get there, they realize there's only a thousand men, maybe, holding the gate. Made up of old men and young men. All the way from grandfathers. Grandfathers up here down to grandchildren. Um... This is the last remnants. They get told then that the remaining people of the of the Westfold, three quarters of those people are hiding in the caves, but they are well stocked and supplied and can withstand a siege if they need to. This is when we get the first of the banter too between Legolas and Gimli. Um, the two of them are discussing this coming tide and how Gimli is marveling at Helm's Deep and saying, you'll give me a, a hundred of my dwarven kin in a year and I could make this place into a fortress worth defending. You know, it's already good, but I can make it better. And, and Legolas replies, that's definitely true, but I, you know, what I wouldn't give to have a hundred of the archers of, of my homeland, Mirkwood, with me. Um, and Gimli finally says, you know what? No, oh, I'm ready. I'm tired. I need to sleep. Um, but a row of orc necks would shake the weariness from my body. So it's just very funny here because we're getting this, this comedic banter in the middle of all of this, which I wonder how much of this comes from Tolkien's experience in the field. Where you have men who are, you know, facing the scariest shit you could ever imagine, being in these trenches and in these situations where you're outnumbered twenty to one, 
what can you do? I mean, the only way to stave off t absolute terror is to joke around with each other and try to find a spark of hope and, and a glimmer of, you know, of something in the friendships that you have as people. I think this is really another um, speaks to his experience in that arena. It says it's now past midnight. The sky is utterly dark. The clouds are seared by a blinding flash as branched lightning smote down upon the eastward hills, and for a brief moment, the watchers saw the space between them and the dike lit with a white light, boiling and crawling with black shapes. Arrows thick as rain came whistling over the battlements. The assault had begun. Now, throughout the next, the rest of the chapter, basically, um, we keep getting referred back to the lightning flashing and what they're seeing, you know, lightning flashing off of helms marked with the the hand of Saruman, spears, and it just says a never-ending sea of orcs, wave after wave after wave of just an unendless amount of orcs and men of Dunland and beyond. Aragorn, when this first happens, Aragorn calls Amber to his side and says, this is the hour when we draw swords together, and running like fire, they sped upon the wall and out the steps and out upon the rock. And then here's this moment where they, it literally says, as one, they draw their swords, they both cry out the names of their swords, and then they attack. And they they push them back, and then as they're returning, they get ambushed by other orcs, and Amor goes down. But Gimli jumps out of nowhere and saves him, and we get some more comedy here, because... <laughs> Gimli literally says, hey, I followed you to shake off the sleep, but as I looked upon the hillmen, they seemed overly large to me, so I sat upon a stone to see your sword play. <laughs> he's just like, he's just waiting, watching these two. I got tears in my eyes because it's making me laugh so much. He was just waiting. He's like, yeah, I'm just going to let you guys take care of it. You're good. You know, coming back. I said, hey, I could take out the orc. I can help you out. But in the meantime, I'm just going to let you take out the, the hillmen because they're too big for me. He says, uh... We gotta get back and tell Legolas because I've killed two. And as they get back and, and this happens, Legolas is like, "You gotta catch up, buddy. I've killed twenty already." <laughs> it's great. Um, this goes on, of course, throughout the chapter. I've killed twenty-one, and Legolas replies, "Good for you, but I'm up to twenty-four." Um, we do get a little bit more history here as Gambling talks about how here he can speak the language of the Hillmen. And they are yelling into the darkness, you know, kill the king, all these insults. Um, and he talks about how they have not forgotten their grievance, that 500 years ago the lords of Gondor gave the mark to Errol the Young, who is the predecessor of the, you know, Theoden's line. And they're still very upset that the land was given to the to the Rohirrim, the men of Rohan, and not to them. Um, that is something that I think is in the Silmarillion, but I don't remember exactly. I know we're going to see some more of this in the upcoming War of the Rohirrim animated film that's being done um, by Peter Jackson's team. Um, as they are talking about this, there's the explosion that happens, and Aragorn cries out, It's the devilry of Saruman! They explode the wall, basically, and they're overrun. Um, Aragorn attempts to drive back the orcs, but he has to flee. Almost gets caught, but Legolas saves him. And there's this moment where yeah, Legolas then says, I need to find Gimli because I'm up to 39. And Aragorn laughs. He literally laughs in the face of all this danger and says, well, if he makes it back to the caves, I'm sure he will surpass your amount as well. Um, this is the moment where doubt finally begins to creep in because they're being overrun and they're now forced all the way back to the caves. Um, Theoden understands the size and strength of the army of Saruman here and he says that if he had known the anger and the size, he might not have listened to the words of Gandalf because his counsels seem now not so good as they did under the morning sun. And Aragorn defends Gandalf and says, Hey, don't judge Gandalf until all of this is over. Only then should you make your judgment. Um, but this is when Theoden makes his great speech about how let us ride out um, and either carve a road or make such an end as will be worthy of song. And then we get into this scene which is so brilliantly done in the film, although it's a little over CGI'd, but uh, it's the scene when King Theoden rides out as the dawn is hitting, and he rides out with Aragorn and Eomer and all of these these men, and it says that the captains and champions of the orcs fell or fled before them, and they rode until they reached the point where they realized that there was a great forest that had now taken over the deepening coombe, and before them, uh, it said that the the ho the host of Saruman cowered. So they're caught between the trees, and they're caught between Theoden and the men of Rohan, and as the dawn is coming. 
And as the orcs are stuck in this place, it says they start to try to climb the cliffs to get away, and they can't because the cliffs are so, so stark. And as this is happening, the dawn is coming, and right as dawn hits, it says a wider and right with a thousand men on foot arrive on the ridge, and it, and it, it explains, you know, it's Urkenbrand. Urkenbrand, Gandalf went and found Urkenbrand and brought him in with the men, so they're blocking the other entrance. And this basically fills the orcs with terror, and everyone charges the orcs. This is one of the coolest lines in the book. This is this is the end of the chapter, but it's really cool. It says, The orcs reeled and screamed and cast aside both sword and spear, and like a black smoke driven by a mountain wind, they fled, wailing under the waiting shadows of the trees, and from that shadow none ever came again. What an end um, to this chapter. Again, The Two Towers is my favorite book in the series. And this is another chapter, much like the Riders of Rohan chapter, this is another one that's up there as one of my favorite chapters of the series, just because of it's an intense, action-packed episode that has humor in it, a little bit of history, but this is Tolkien at his best in my mind, where he's got a little bit of his mythology in, in here, but he's also bringing his experience in the war to play, and it, it makes for a, a chapter that is very well written and shows you the strength of men when it's needed most and how they're driving back Saruman and at least winning this one small battle in the Great War. Very good chapter. Again, if you want to read more, don't forget to follow along, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. Stay tuned for next week. Every every Monday at 11 a.m. we have a new episode coming out. Join our Discord if you want to talk greater details. Happy reading, everybody. See you next week.